real estate agent? Are you looking to acquire clients consistently so you can grow your business and your income to live a great lifestyle? This is Dave Finale and the RE Skill Builder Podcast. Well, welcome everybody. It's Dave Finale, the Real Estate Skill Builder. I'm sorry, Real Estate Talk TGIF episode 148. I see the screen says the wrong number. We will fix that in a second. Um, it's 148. We've been doing this for 145 weeks in a row. We had three extra broadcasts and we have a, a return guest. He was with people before. Now he's by himself. Uh, and his name is Charlie Oppler. Uh, he is the CEO of Prominent Property Sotheby's, a 15 office uh, real estate company in northern New Jersey. He is also just happens to be the president of the 2021 president of the National Association of Realtors. I am also very proud to call him friend. But here's a way we start the day. Here's a trivia question for anybody and everybody that might watch this now or later. True or false? The two people on screen have 80 plus years of experience in real estate. That's true. That's true. Uh, Charlie, you first licensed in 1981. I was first licensed in 76, began in real estate in 1979 and late that year. So we've been around a couple of years, Charlie, right? <laughs> have we not seen everything at this point? I think we've seen a couple of downturns too, I think too. Exactly. You know? Um, but I, I start the program, Charlie, every week with the same question. I ask my guest or guest the same thing. Do you know what TGIF stands for? I know what it stands for, but it, for me, it's not thank God it's Friday. It just means the day before I work on Saturday. Well, that's true. But, but what it actually means is thank God it's finale. So, you know, oh. that's, <laughs> that's the way you've got to look at it. And my screen behind me keeps messing up for me. So we got to fix that from time to time. And... Anyway, so Charlie, here we are. It is it is Friday, April 9th, 2021. We've gone through an awful lot of things in the past year. Um, and uh, it's been it's been kind of it's been a nutty year, man. And you come into the presidency of the National Association of Realtors through all of that. But things haven't changed, have they? You know, it's it's funny, Dave. Uh, you do things in this business without knowing what tomorrow is going to be. And I've served in a leadership capacity since um, 2019 at the national level, but I've been, you know, state president, local board president, but been involved in, in a lot of different things. Right. You, you just don't know from day to day on the national level when you're serving as the president, uh, when you're the spokesperson on a controversial issue or just doing your job, as the broker of, of, of prominent properties. So sure. for me, I've been going back and forth this year where I haven't had that before. So let's talk about, you know, being the broker owner of a company, a uh, CEO of a company. Let's talk about where you've come from. You, I mentioned you started in 1981. Tell us a little bit about, tell us a little bit of your story, right? And, 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 and you know, share that with everybody because I think it's really important for everybody to know not what you do, but see the person behind that. So if you would share a little bit of your story and how you got to where you are today. You know, there was an article in Realtor Magazine, a little bit about who I am and who, you know, how I got here. And uh, in 1980, after I had graduated college, I got a job with the March of Dimes as a fundraiser making $12,000 a year. Ironically, they asked me to start an event and I recruited Joe Murphy, from Murphy Realty Better Homes and Gardens and Dick Schlott, Schlott Realtors, to be co-chairs of an event. They both told me I'd do well in real estate, got my license nine months later, became a salesperson. Four years later, I'm managing an office for Dick Schlott uh, in 1985. And 36 years later, I'm still managing real estate offices, if you will, just now they're not one office that I was responsible for and whatever it was, 40, 50 people in an office to now a company. Uh, and it's still the same day to day responsibilities. It's people. It's making sure you're coaching, helping, progressing every day. And, and I still love that. So um, I partnered with Randy Keytive in 1992. 
uh, when I left um, Schlott Realtors and Murphy, who I had worked for the 10 years previously, and we started a company called Classic Realty. Um, we operated that for 17 years, and then we acquired prominent property Sotheby's in 2009. And this is our 11th year, 12th year uh, running that operation. So we've been partners 30 years. Uh, when, we, when we merged in 2009, we had about 280 agents and five or six offices. Now we're just a little bit bigger with 15 offices and over 700 agents. So it's, it's been a great ride, but it's, a, a, it's just a great business. And a good friend of mine, John Smaby, once said, it's the greatest business in the world. And, you know, I wake up every day thinking about how lucky I am uh, to share time with realtors because they're just good people. Yeah, they are good people. They got really good soul, and 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 it's 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 just for me. It's been it's been a lot of fun in the brokerage business, especially 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 simply because I get to interact with people. And every day I wake up thankful and grateful that I get to help people every day. And that's really my goal every day. I wake up and I get to do that more and more every day. And when I don't have a great day, because we all have off days, right? I think I helped somebody today. Yeah, you know that's where yeah. the so. So let's let's get into some of the some of the things we want to talk about. I mean, there's so many things you're involved in, and we'll we'll start with 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 your job and what you do as your 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 official capacity as president of NAR. And you know, let's just kick it off and uh, with it's Fair Housing Month. So let's talk about fair housing and let's talk about different things going on with that. So talk to me about that and and what your goals and and and, and policies are as we move forward. You know, I spoke at RIS Media this week, and I spoke at Home Services of America this week, and it's all about DEI. You know, diversity and inclusion, right, is really an, an equity or equality, either way you want to talk about it. But, um, you know, this industry, especially in northern New Jersey, where a lot of us work, um, you know, there are so many different people that live in our, our metropolitan area. So, I think the day-to-day -day activity that we all see is just normal. But around the country, and, and even in our own area, uh, I don't think we're educated enough about fair housing, the laws, the protected classes, so on and so forth. So we've issued a challenge, and I would issue it here to everybody that's watching. Uh, we asked our leadership team, our board of directors, our executive committee to, to take what's known as the um, uh, fair housing challenge, to watch a video called Fairhaven, which is about an hour and a half. And you can go to nar.realtor Fairhaven. And it's about a simulation of storytelling about real life discrimina discriminations that take place. And if you take the test and it's interactive, you'll be amazed at what you don't know. Second part of that challenge is to watch a video that's about 45 minutes called Implicit Bias where you subconsciously don't even know that you're acting in a discriminatory manner. So we've challenged our team there. And then finally, the third phase is to get your at home with diversity certification, which is an eight hour course online. Uh, again, talks about fair housing and diversity, equity and inclusion. So I think we look at this as, as a three level program and, and use ACT as the acronym. It's accountability to our fellow realtors, to the consumer, to the customer, to every the client, everybody and anybody you deal with. It's culture change. It's being different, it's being out of your comfort zone to know that you did something wrong. And then ultimately, you know, T stands for training because you can't get anywhere without the education, the training. So, you know, we, we promoted the ACT acronym. Uh, NAR has a director of fair housing, Brian Green, who has spoken to our company and many companies, uh, worked for HUD for 29 years. And we're just trying to take it to the next level to make sure it's not about the law. It's not about this and that. It's the right thing to do. You know, I mean, if we all did it, we wouldn't have a problem. That's just not the case. The interesting part of, of there's two things that you, you you said here that I mean it all it, it, it all is really cool and really really important. But you talked said two things. You talked about culture change, and along with that, I put together with that the right thing to do. You know, yeah. I think I, I think you know open mindedness is something that people need. 
because let's face it, I mean, we all grow up a certain way. And when we grew up in the 50s and 60s, I mean, the 60s for me, for you too, I believe, right? We grew up in the 60s and 70s. And, yep. and we heard what, yep, our parents said or how our parents did, what our yep. friends did. We heard all that stuff and we're still hearing it. Here's the difference, I believe, is now we need to say something about it rather than letting you go. Well, that's just how he is or that's just how that is. So what I'm what I'm getting at, Charlie, is culture, right? Yep. The culture change of what it is and, and not taking it anymore, not standing for it anymore. And I don't mean in an in a in an aggressive manner. I mean in a culture change sort of manner. Like, hey, you know what, man? This is what it is. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I I'll give you one example. Section eight, right? If you're a listing broker on a property. And, and the agent that's working with the, the prospective tenant says the word Section 8. How many listing brokers run from that? A lot. Without knowing any details, not the person's credit, not the person's situation, nothing. Right? That's just implicit bias. You know, it, it's reacting to something that you think is going to put your landlord at a disadvantage or in a, a bad situation you don't know right. think about that consumer and yet as we all know you know that subsidized rent is pretty guaranteed so yes you know but let's look you, at the whole picture do you think do you think that that's uh, i believe it is do you think it's old school thinking when you hear section eight from years ago in the 60s or 70s or 80s is that does that or it has nothing to do with it you know, I don't think that way, but unfortunately, you know, in any family, any business, any anything, um, people that get into it learn from people that have been in it. You know, so history is a great teacher. Sometimes the lessons aren't always as good as they should be. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's, you know, I think that's part of the issue, you know, and keep in mind the average age of a realtor um, is is probably 58, I think it's 57 or 58 right now. And when we look at membership, and Dave, you, you and I have been around a while, you know, three out of every four that come into the business don't make it and they're gone in two or three years. Right. So right. the ones that are successful are in the business 20, 30, 40 years, right? Right. right. still active and still playing. So, you know, who's teaching who here? And that's, you know, I think that's where the training, the culture change, the accountability has got to be on each company to bring those new agents to a level of education so that they understand fair housing, understand Section 8, understand uh, fair haven, implicit bias, <laughs> culture change, because it starts with us. You know, if we're not accountable to our own companies, um, then, then where are we? I, I, I think you make, you make an excellent point there, but in, in, in one way that I look at things, when I had my brokerage and still today as a, as a mentor, as a coach, I look at, I look at new agents in a manner the way I always did. And one of the things I said to them is please in your, in the first couple of months, you listen to the person training you, you listen to your mentor, your coach, whoever it is, your broker, please do not listen to the other agents because honestly, if we got it, we've got to look at that 80, 20 rule where, I mean, there it, it, it's true. There's a lot of agents doing things because they see other agents doing it. And a lot of that's incorrect. And I believe oh, that's, where, I believe that's absolutely hundred percent. And that's where the bad training comes from. And that's where the bad attitudes are made just in this alone. Right. Oh, section eight, you know, it, it, I'm sorry. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the bad leading the bad. And I always told my new agents, please don't talk to any experienced agents for at least a month. Right. Because they would get the wrong, the wrong idea. You know, it's just like the same thing. You know, you say, well, you got to learn your sphere of influence. You got to work with them and you go to an agent outside. So I tried that. That didn't work. Yeah. It's the same thing, right? You know, that that's the reason the people doing business these days are either the, the veterans who have that sphere of influence that never goes away right. or, some, or some of the newer agents, five, six years in the business that don't look at the external factors and say, I can do this. I've talked to enough people around the country. They're in the think tanks and the mastermind type groups and say, okay, I know what happens in Minneapolis or Omaha or, or Dallas, right? May not be the same product here in terms of price, 
but it's the real estate industry and it's prospecting and it's customers and it's clients and it's people. Right. And people are, you know, people are, are, are the ones that make it what it is. And I'm with you. If you think about training and new agents, right? We could train an agent for two or three weeks. And if we go back to the industry 30, 40 years ago, you went through training for a month, right? And what happened the first time you got a real life lead for a listing or a buyer? You had no idea what to do. That's right. And then, That's right. And then you went and asked somebody, even though you had training for a month, because it wasn't a real life situation. Right. And once it goes live is really when you start to ask questions. And are you asking your manager or your broker? Or are you going to an agent, as you said, that really doesn't have the time if they're good? Or if they're not as solid as, as an agent that's good, then you're learning from somebody who probably shouldn't be helping you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you could, you could say that that's, you know, a problem in our industry. I know there's a lot of people that a lot of people scream for, you know, increase the barriers to admission and all this other stuff. And, and, and that's something yeah. that we talked about. Yeah. So uh, go the, ahead. Problem with that, the, the problem with barriers is it's not something that NAR can have really a whole lot of say on because licensing is done at each of the states. Uh, right. You know, think about the fact that New Jersey was the last state to have continuing education. Right. So you talk about barriers. Let's talk about upping performance. CE didn't exist in the state. There was no accountability in the state. When I was state president in 2004 and I asked that question to, to brokers in a, in a room of strategic thinking yes. or strategic strat planning, whatever it was called 15 years ago. Right. There were 37 brokers in the room. New Jersey had big brokers and still does, right? Yep. Still two were in favor. 35 said, leave it alone. It's not your job. Go figure that. What, what, what more can you, you say at that point? I know. Uh, I, I want to get back. I want to get back to the to the culture question that I brought up: accountability, et cetera, et cetera, and training. Um, and basically, you know, and we spoke about this the other day when we were on the phone. Um, it's all about how to treat people. Yep. So, is there aside from training classes where people stick their nose up at having to do another session and all this other stuff? Is there any other way to teach people how to treat people? I mean, I know it sounds like a really stupid question. I know, but it's, I mean, I don't know. I, you know what? You create your culture, you know, by who you hire, who you fire, uh, who you associate with. And, and I think that's always the challenge for brokerage, big, small, massive, um, you know, what, what's your value proposition? Right. All right. And I think if you look at it, you're trying to create an environment where your agents can do the best in terms of making a living and supporting one another. Every year, the toughest decision I have for me in my company is we give out a president's award. Right. It could be one person, two, three. And every year I struggle because we have so many good people. But there's that intangible that stands out about somebody at any given point in time. OK, right. one of my jobs as the um, president of NAR is to, to pick somebody to do the invocation and pledge of allegiance. Now, that sounds simple for the for the national meetings. Two people jumped right to the front of my mind for whatever reason. Okay. For the pledge, it was somebody who's a, uh, been in real estate 25 years, become one of my closest friends in North Carolina, and he was in the military. OK. You know, I think of Wendell every time that, you know, if I, if I need to pick me up, here's a guy that's right there. Same thing with the invocation. Somebody who I know is just one of the best people I've ever met. So, you know, I think those are the kind of people you want to surround yourself with. And I think that just goes back to culture and, and accountability in your office and hopefully teaching them to do the right things. But it also is that broker to broker relationship, Dave. If somebody does something wrong being able to pick up the phone and tell them, hey, that wasn't the right way to do things. And and you know what? We have filed ethics charges. We filed arbitration because if somebody doesn't see the right and the wrong, then, you know, you can't let them get away with it, to your point. 
So, so let's talk about that policing, right? And, and yeah. I think the best way to police anything is to police it ourselves, but we don't see that a lot, do we? No. I'll, I'll give you a great example yesterday, okay? We are listening. The agent put down the wrong amount on, on the um, uh, compensation to a buyer's agent and to a transaction broker, right? Put the wrong amount, just hit the wrong key. Called the broker who sold the property and said, you know what? I just noticed it, right? You, you don't, I, I mean, realtors don't read all the time. Mistakes happen. Yep. Our manager called that agent because they didn't want, she didn't want it to be agent versus agent and just said, here's the situation. Okay. You're entitled to it. You're going to penalize the listing broker because they made a mistake. You guys have a good relationship. You're probably going to have to work together in the future. Would you consider taking, you know, the percentage that should have been offered? I had no feel for what this person would do. Right, right. She said, absolutely. Mistakes happen, and I hope somebody would treat me the same way. Okay? We have good people in the business. Right. That person also knows that we're a pretty strong player in the market, and so are they. Right. They want to make sure that relationships matter. And I think that it gave me some renewed trust in some of the people that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And and you think, and it goes back to your 80-20 rule. Is it 85-15 yep. these days? I'll yeah, give might you, have, might have I'll give you a that's eye-opening. Ready? We it have 1,450,000 <laughs> agents, not agents, realtors. Realtors. Okay, there's well over 2 million agents in the country, maybe close to 3 million now, licensees. Ready? There's a million 100,000 listings on the market right now. In theory, there's less than one house per agent. Right. Like 0.8. Right. Okay. Yet we know the 85-25, uh, 85-25, 85-15 rule, right? Yes. Guess what? How many people have no business right now? Um, a good 60%, if not more. If not more. So, not more. you know, but yet you need those people in the office for culture, for assistance, for help. Maybe not all of them. OK, but, you know, there's always that person that can turn their career around. So, and there's so, always a manager and a broker that says, I'm going to help them. So let me take this. To, let me take this to another direction that we didn't talk about yet and, and haven't. But so there's 1.4 million realtors in our business today, which yeah. means you're a member of NAR. So it's a it's a two part question. When we were in March of 2020. Yep. And then April and then May. And now this year, what did you expect that number to be? Did you expect that number to change at all because of the pandemic and because of lack of business or whatever? What were your beginning thoughts and how did that evolve to thinking how many would it still be 1.4? No, we, we, we didn't talk about that, but I can give you my honest answer. I thought our yeah. membership, I thought our membership would start to drop. I did, too. OK, and guess what? There are more people in real estate school now than we've had in years. But somebody said something really interesting <laughs> to me. You know, there are a lot of people in the service industry, restaurants, um, hotels and, and, and whatever you de deem to be service, that those businesses aren't coming back. So people look at real estate as a service and sales skill industry. Right. If they're used to the service industry, they've got to learn the sales skills. And they've got to learn the product and, and this business in general. But they've been dealing with people, many of them, their whole life. So it was natural, and, and it goes back to your barriers, to enter the real estate business costs you a couple hundred dollars and you get a license. Right. right. And maybe it costs you $1,000 in the year, 2000 500 whatever. I don't, every broker's different. And you're in the real estate business. Yeah, around you know, basically in in, in northern New Jersey, we're talking about around eleven hundred bucks, eleven okay. twelve hundred bucks for every for one MLS, so on and so forth. So I do the numbers all all the time. 
And, and you know, the interesting part of the number of realtors, I thought it was really going to plummet. I really did. And then what I started seeing, I'm a, I'm a, um, I work with a lot of new agents. I have like 40 some that I work with now. And I'm going to tell you that more than half of them, their ideal of getting into the business was to become an investor. And they figured if they had their license, they could do a better job at it. Completely different than a couple of years ago. And that's what replaced, I think, the people that have left the business that either were done with it or said they couldn't make it. There's a lot of people still with their head in the sand trying to survive. Well, right? HGTV doesn't help because everybody thinks you can buy a house, fix it up and flip it for a profit. Um, you know, not every house is, is $12 to renovate the kitchen. You know, um, I'm yeah. still amazed that when I watch some of the numbers, I keep thinking, you know, and they all, every house looks better than the next. And I'm still amazed at the dollars that it costs to fix the house because I can't picture that happening in New Jersey. Um, I, but know. I, I know. But, but that's not something I'm going to do. So I don't have to worry about it. Even though I'd love to fix up a house and flip it, it's just not something I'm going to do. Uh, the liability for me is way too much to even think about it. For me, for me, honestly, that's the whole, that, that's the most fun I have is building and renovating. You know, it's funny. Just as a quick aside, you remember that TV show that used to be on every week they, where they built the house in seven days. I, I just never understood how they did that. But what do I know, right? They can do it in seven days. I guess I can do it in four months. I always did it in four months anyway. But anyway, yep. I, I digress. So um, when we're talking about a lot of things, there's a lot of things going on. Um, I want to pick your brain now in some of the stuff that's going on in your your national capacity. There's been a lot of talk about um, MLSs. There's been a lot of talk of Department of Justice stuff going on, um, and um, nobody understands it. Nobody knows why. There's other uh, lawsuits going on in different states. Could you expand upon some of this stuff about um, buyer agents and all that stuff? Um. Let me try to give you a, a, a 30,000 foot overview because cool. the, the details are, are really, um, I mean, they're so minute that thank, thankfully we have legal counsel, you know, both in-house at the National Association of Realtors and we, we use, use outside counsel as well. Um, from the lawsuit side of it, okay, there's been a case in Missouri and there's been a couple of cases in Illinois all copycat cases. So if, if you're a practitioner, understand the premise of the lawsuit is that we're not a competitive business. Okay. Okay. Which I think most of us would say that premise doesn't work. I mean, I feel like we're in competition every moment of every day, whether you're in your own office with agents or against in Northern New Jersey, Bergen County alone's got what, 10,000 plus, and, and Hudson County may have another 10,000. So, you know, you look at a geographic region of 30 miles, you might have 20,000 agents. That's correct. By definition, I think that makes you competitive. Okay. Uh, yep. But the lawsuit basically says that we're not a competitive business, number one. Number two, that by the way we do business in the MLS is where the seller authorizes a commission and then shared in most cases, not all cases, because everything's negotiable. In most cases, the listing broker takes the listing and shares the commission with a buyer's agent or transaction agent. Right. The lawsuit says that that's costing the consumer, the buyer consumer more money because they haven't negotiated their own deal with their buyer's agent. We're saying if you take away the multiple listing system, which is what is being asked, OK, you now have Dave Finale may work with a seller. Charlie Opler may work with a buyer. If I don't know you have a listing. Or Joe Smith has a listing or Mary Jones, that consumer is not given an equal opportunity to, to see all properties that are there. Number That's one. Right. That's right. Number two, I may be collecting my fee from the buyer as the buyer's agent. But now I've got to go find a property for them, whether it's unlisted, listed, or wherever it is, because I don't have a multiple listing system to find those properties. 
by taking a listing in the MLS, you've exposed it to as many buyers as possible, which was right. really the essence of the clear cooperation policy was right. to, to, to share the information, to put everybody on the equal level of most buyers should see a property. So we, we, we as the National Association of Realtors, and understand that that lawsuit's not just against NAR, it's against Keller Williams, Remax, Realogy, and Home Services. So the suit thinks that, for lack of a better word, we're all in this collusive stage to harm the buyer and cost the consumer more money. So we, we think it's wrong, on, obviously, on the law, wrong on the premise, and just wrong. So right. we're fighting that. Ironically, around the same time that that lawsuit hit, the Department of Justice launched an investigation into the way real estate works. Understand they did this in 2008 and everything was fine. Yeah, but, right. But here we go again. So uh, a couple of things that have come out of that case and it's still being worked on language is um, MLSs should not be able to separate or search category by the commission offered to the buyer's agent or transaction agent. So that field has to be taken down that okay. we can't advertise any part of our business is free. Well, nothing's free in life. Right. So why should we use the word free, you know, free market analysis. What's wrong with yeah. that? Probably. What's wrong with that? That that's not wrong. Okay. That's okay because it's a prospecting phase. Okay. But to say, Come work with me, Charlie Oppler, for free as the buyer's agent when I'm going to collect a fee is not free. It's great. It's great. Okay. Yep. Number three um, was that the buyer's agent should know how much the seller is paying the buyer's agent. And that should be published online if the buyer is searching any fields online. What's the difference? It's public information. We don't have a problem with that. Um, if I take a listing at X percent and I offer out X percent or Y percent, the buyer should have the right to know that is what the Department of Justice is saying. We're not, you know, you're, we're not going to fall our, on our swords there. But generally speaking, that has not been an issue because when they write the offer, they see it also right on the contract. Right. Exactly. And if you sign an agency agreement with the buyer, you've explained how the business works, right? informed consent if you've done your consumer information statement as per the state of new jersey you've explained how it works but here's a question because you said so, the buyer, buyer a buyer's agreement right yeah. so, okay, so you, get, you get into the accountability side are you doing your agent as a, as you are you doing your job as a buyer's agent at first contact exactly That's the question so, exactly. so we're working with the department of justice and we think we're going to be okay there yeah, I think so too. I, here, here's a, talking about buyers' agreements. You know, I, as I said, I work with a lot of new agents, right? And and one yeah. of the things they keep talking, everybody's told, get a buyers' agreement, get a buyers' agreement. Don't take anybody out without a buyers' agreement. So I had a, I had a, an interesting situation recently with a new agent that that said, okay, well, I got the buyers' agreement. I said, do you know what it means? <laughs> what do you mean? I said, well, you're going, you're calling for sale by owners, and you're asking them to pay you a commission. But then you got a buyer's agreement. What does it say on there? I said, do you realize that that means that your buyer's going to pay you? And that's more money they got to come up with? Yep. It's not explained well. Or if it's, it may not even be explained at all. You, you know what? Here's the irony in it. You know what phase of the business is really clear in most cases? Commercial. Exactly. Right. Because you, you sign a tenant or a, or a purchaser to an exclusive agreement right from the beginning, if you're doing your job correctly. Right. We don't do the same thing on the residential side. And maybe that's something that, you know, in 40 years, it has not taken real hold, but maybe one day it will be prevalent everywhere. Well, you know, it's, um, it, it's different state to state and area to area, isn't it though? I mean, aren't some states doing it regularly? I, I don't know. You hear right. that anecdotally, but I'm not so sure that, you know, that it is. And, and this would, I mean, there's, you hear, you and I've heard this phrase a lot over our years, 
procuring cause, right? <laughs> it kind of would take that away, that argument away if we had a procuring cause. Well, instead we didn't have it, we had a buyer's agreement. And basically guys, all it is is you're listing a buyer, like it's like you list a seller. Yeah, there's actually a, a couple services, you know, that are still in their infancy stage that are MLS list MLS services for buyers. That they'll list buyers. I think homebuyers.com is one. Um, uh, John Heidhouse, I believe, is is the guy's name that I saw it as part of a, a tech presentation a number of years ago. I don't know whatever happened to it, but it was the same premise. Let me have a buyer's agent, you know, buyer service, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a service locally, a, a young agent near us has is trying to build a service just, just for buyer agreements, right? He's along the right line. I think he's just a few years too early because no one's really buying into it. Um, so, well, and, so and, what's the, and what's the loyalty of a buyer at that point too? Because it's informed consent that they may not know what they're signing or getting into. Right. So and then the next thing comes in, okay, you sign a buyer's agreement. Is there a three-day attorney review to that? <laughs> a lot of questions. Right. Exactly. Yep. You know, I mean, I know some sellers recently, they want attorney review before attorney review, you know, and, and, and it's, 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 it's becoming nuts. It's becoming, well, you know what, if you look back on it, like our years that we've been in this, you can look back on it and says, everything keeps getting more and more litigious as we go on anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, and we just got to There are many states that don't use attorneys. Right. So with, with title services, you get back to your point about procuring cause the real the local boards, you know, through their arbitration and ethics process probably are busier in states where there are just title companies, because with attorneys, a lot of times, at least we, we know more about the transaction that's happening. And then again, states with attorneys operate differently. Right. Yep. More in New Jersey, we, we sign contracts, go to attorney review, New York in more cases will reach an agreement, but they do their inspections and all their due diligence before the contract gets signed. So everybody, you know, every place is different. So I've also seen, I've also seen, because I work with, uh, with, with agents all over the country, and I've seen in some groups where, that where it's a non-attorney area, they're starting to use attorneys a little bit more because of, because of arguments and, 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 and things that they can't solve between the two, uh, two sides. Um, well, I'll leave you with one last thought. It's still 95% of the time, the single biggest investment somebody's going to make right. um, in their life is, is regarding housing. So um, it, it wouldn't shock me if it, you're starting to see some of that more around the country than just in what we're used to in New Jersey. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Let's, let's talk about, let's talk about business. Let's talk about the real estate business in and of itself. You and I have seen differences and uh, I mean, so you've seen changes in evolution of business over the last 40 years, um, business models, uh, business gimmicks. I mean, we've seen we've seen the foxes of the world come and go, purple bricks, et cetera. We've seen them come and go and, and, and they really weren't great models because they didn't make it. Um, but then you, we start seeing now we start seeing, you know, the bricks and mortar to non bricks and mortar. We start seeing a lot of money flying around. What is your interpretation of, of the relevance of all the different models and can they all survive? Well, history again is a great teacher. Yep. You know, we've been in this business a long time. Um, when I first started, it was broker centric, right? You knew who the names of the brokers were. For us, I knew Weikert, I knew Schlott, I knew Murphy. There were other companies Right. But they stood out. Now, also understand back then, newspaper advertising and a yard sign were the only two lead generators other than your sphere of influence. That's correct. OK, there was no Internet. As I my kids and I tease all the time, they don't even know what a typewriter was. Some of them. That's right. OK, I lived on the typewriter in college because there were no computers. Yeah. And, I, and I'll tell you, my first year in real estate business. We had we had really fancy technology. We had a typewriter with three colors. <laughs> I'll go one step further. The highlight of my college career was when IBM made a Selectric typewriter that erased without the little um, piece of paper you had to put in to erase your mistake. Oh, oh you yeah, hit the yeah, button yeah. to erase it. So that was progress for us. Right. Um, so to me, when I started, it was broker centric. You knew who the broker was. 
you know, then Remax came into play in the mid eighties in Northern New Jersey. I don't know when they started. So then it started to turn a little bit to the agent side, right? You know, in terms of compensation, but it didn't replace the broker still being the main player. Then from my perspective and everybody looks at this differently, then managers started to evolve and really you saw some big offices being built because that's who you wanted to work for. I want to work for Dave Finale. I want to work for Charlie Opler. And I, I would maybe start to, to, to migrate to the bigger offices because they were busy and they were in the, the limelight in a marketplace. Then commissions just, everything's changed in the last 10 or 15 years in commission models with all the different companies that have come out and, and, and competed, but we've always competed against each other. It's just different right. competitors now. Right. You mentioned a few earlier that aren't here anymore, but I don't look at the longevity of anybody because I was taught by a gentleman by the name of Bob Becker, who ran NRT first, who said, you can be aware of what everybody else does, but worry about what you do. You do. Okay, and be accountable to your people and, and that side of it. Everybody's got a shiny new, new toy. Everybody's got a story, but you're responsible for what you do. So I think it went broker, manager, agent, model over 40 years. And guess what? They all survive. They all can survive because there's enough business for everybody, but then there's not enough business for anybody. When you Great look point. at this. Great point. That's really the way I look at it. There's enough for everybody because there's over 125, 130,000 transactions in the state a year, not counting rentals, not net counting some of the new construction buildings that don't go through any sources. Um, you know, you go to a building that's got 300 units. Nobody knows I sold six units. Right. right? Because right. it gets reported in the deeds, but not in terms of what we know about each other. So I just think that when you look at this business, there's always going to be room for the good people. But that's the agent as well as the broker. And what am I going to do to help my agents do more business? That's so, what it so comes down to. It, it does come down to that. Is, is, it, is it what is the broker going to do or what is the system going to do? Because look... Um, Systems don't fail, people fail, right? So when you've got systems that work and you use the system, it gives you a better opportunity to succeed. So, But everybody's know, got their own system, Dave. If, right. If, if you look at some of the top producers, some of them will laugh and say, I don't use the system. I, I, have, I, have, I don't want to say a Rolodex because now they've progressed to a Microsoft Excel sheet, okay? And they've got a list of everybody they've dealt with. And guess what? Some of the top agents in this business look at their phone every day and know that they hadn't talked to somebody in two weeks. Right? Right, right. And they pick up the phone and say, hey, Dave, I know you, you, you know, you're not moving, but do you know anybody that might be moving in your neighborhood? It's just basic prospecting. Um, uh, and it's still going to work. Um, it always has. You know, it, 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 you're you're right, and, and it, it's funny. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, a mastermind every Monday. There's a hundred and some people on his mastermind. There's probably about three billion dollars worth of business on that mastermind, and basically, no matter who they are on this on this call, they're all talking about systems. They're all talking about I can give you all the information you need, but if you don't do the work with the system, you're not going to succeed. Right? There's not a chance you can succeed. So when I say systems don't fail, people fail, any system that's out there, whether that it's with a you. It, 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 you have to work them, right? Yeah. And that was the thing we talked about, I've talked about a lot is, you know, talk to people who are working the systems that work. Don't talk to the people that, that know about a system, right? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'll that, give you an example. A good friend of mine in Utah does about 150 sales a year. Average price is 280000 in his market. So we do the math, it's about $40 million in business, right? Yep. Yet our, a person in, in northern New Jersey could do 25 sales and do $50 million. So, So maybe he needs a different system than the person here because of the volume of units. So it's really 
as you said, it's it's what works for you and what keeps you focused on how to continue to do your business and grow your business or control your business. Because the one thing is there's always somebody else who wants a piece of what you're doing. Um, and, 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 you know, here's the other side of it right now with the portals and everything, you know, most of them are buyer centric, right? They give you more yep. buyers. Yeah. You want to do a survey of people that need more buyers right now, or do you need more listings? <laughs> I, I, you know, I think it's, I, I think it's, um, I think it's a mistake in the back of everybody's mind that they make where they want, you know, get me leads, get me leads, get me leads. But, you know, the majority of the people that I don't think don't, that don't succeed after a few years are the ones that are looking for, oh, I'll take this leader, I'll take this buyer, rather than going out and getting it themselves. Right. You know, I believe between 2004 and 2008, a lot of agents became order takers. Right. And that also happened a little bit now, but not as much as back then, because you could go out, get a deal like that. And what it did was it made some agents, I hate to use the word, but made them lazy where they thought they could get the business, you know, one, two, three, just by waking up. And that's where a lot of the problems came for the newer agents, where we didn't get as much production. Why, as you said earlier, you know, within, within two to three years, you know, 75 percent of the agents are going to leave the business. You know, so, I mean, it has to do with when we look at brokerages, as I mentioned, models earlier, it's all, all about the best fit for the agent and what they're looking to do. Because they're, because if they look long term, they're going to have a better idea what model is going to fit them best. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. And, you know, they're, they're, the reason there's a lot of models is because people need different things for themselves. You know, and, and to me, you can't make somebody like something that they don't like, you know, because it's not in, in who they are. And we forget who people are and what they're comfortable with. And, you know, it's that, can I fit that round peg into the square hole? Everybody's different. It's why there's been multiple brokerages forever, right? There's whatever right. in the state, 2,500 brokerages out of 55,000 realtors. I mean, you go into some towns, you got 50 and 60 brokerages in one town. You right. know, the average size of a brokerage is probably less than 10 people. Right. Right. Okay. You lose sight of some of those things and those people make a living. They make a living and they're successful as they define it. Not as you and I define it, as they define it. You know, I, I, I look at, I think about what, you, what you're saying and, but, you know, in those, in those respects, it's all about what they want. You know, I mean, you know, we, we see you and I see this all the time with with agents that want to succeed or they say they want to succeed. But let's face it, the business that they're doing is the business that they want to do, whether it's three transactions or 33 transactions. That's what they want to do because that's what they've committed to. Right. Well, I I think it's it's always about expectations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, it's, it's, so, so everybody's different. You know, uh, my, again, my buddy in Utah, if he's not doing a hundred plus transactions a year, he doesn't think his team is successful. Okay. But like you said, I can't control the inventory right now. He said, I know everybody, but you can't make somebody move. You know, the average person we started moved every three or four years. Right. Now it's every 10 plus years. Well, that <laughs> inherently is going to slow down your inventory. Cost, so cost of supplies see, right now. What's that? The cost of supplies to build new property right now. It's holding a lot of builders back because they can't build and sell it for what it costs to build it right now. Right. Right. And that's and that's actually what's holding. What, what we're seeing, at least in, in, in our area, northern New Jersey, is we're seeing a lot of luxury rentals being built. Right. We're seeing a lot of that. And honestly, I don't believe that that's going to make up for the lack of construction of new buildings, new housing that we need, you know? I mean, where do you see that, uh, Charlie? I, 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 you know what? I look at it from the Wall Street st standpoint and the investment side of it. Number one, banks would much more happily, if that's the right grammar, which is probably not, give money to an, an investor slash builder on a rental product because they know the absorption is so much quicker right. than the for sale product. Right. And then you have, uh overall investors looking at a cap rate 
thinking that it's going to continue to grow rental you know the cost of, of renting in the metropolitan area is expensive and not everybody wants to own a property i still think it's the american dream that home own, of home ownership right, right not everybody thinks that way they want to be more liquid and invest in something else maybe a commercial property maybe the stock market maybe something else maybe in a company so um there are different ways to look at it but the rental market has been very strong in northern new jersey for a number of years so we look into if we look into charlie Apple's crystal ball and what the market's going to look like in six to 24 months where do you think it's going to go opinion <laughs> i would not use 2020 as a barometer i think the, the 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 fact i look at 2019 and try to compare where we are in 2021 to 19. okay other than the fact we know that the appreciation is there but in terms of where i think the units are going to be um my crystal ball says interest rates stay between three and three and a half percent all year um we're still going to have a huge demand of buyers out there you know let's face it you know the baby boomers were the biggest generation at one point in time right yep millennials have blown by them and and the, the gen x and gen y and gen z and gen anybody <laughs> are all, are all going to go and, and make us look like we were dwarfed so the buyer pool is going to stay strong um i think the one unknown for me is what the phenomenon of work at home and what the hybrid looks going forward because as long as companies have been profitable and many have been they can look at the cost to run their business in the future and say i don't need to have all that office space in new york city but i'll take two or three satellites one in greenwich uh one in westchester county maybe one in fairfield and bergen county for my workers to have a place to go and it's a lot less expensive to run your business so i think 21 looks pretty solid to me with interest rates and demand i think it carries into 22 at least half the year then you start to get into your midterm elections change of political parties um and and then if inventory catches up, we're going to find out really where inflation goes, where interest rates go, and where the economy is. Um, so I think we're strong for 21. I think 22 could be another great year. 23 is where I start to get a little concerned, especially on prices, because I think people have really paid through, you know, through and through, because like we all have done, you don't look at the price, you look at your monthly payment. Um, and there, there are people who have locked in, David, at two and a half and two point six, two yep. five on thirty-year mortgages. And you yep. know what their first payment is? More principal than interest. Yep, that's impossible, but it happens. Right. So I mean, you just you just mentioned a really fundamental thought process that we as realtors need to give to our buyers and our sellers: the difference yeah. between price and cost. Yep. Right. No one understands. Well, whatever you pay for the house, I, I don't care what the number is. What's it going to cost you for, per month? And, and, and what's involved in that? Like commuting, that used to be a huge cost. That was part of your cost for the month. Now it might not be as big of a cost. Gasoline, you know, all this stuff, vehicles. People are going to buy vehicles, cars, because they like them rather than they need them. Right? There's not going to be, there's not as much of a need. I mean, I remember a post I saw on Facebook. Uh, I think from my friend Dustin Brome, who said, I'm now getting one week to the gallon. How's everybody else doing? <laughs> yeah. Week to the gallon. That was a, you know, kind of a you joke. Know, it made sense I got to tell you, when I fill up my tank now, it's like, when did I do it last? Yes. Um, you know, and, and we all know what gas prices were during the pandemic. So now right. that they've, they've gone up 50%, we're like, wow, it's super high. We forget when it was three and a half and four dollars a gallon. For a long time right so you know the way the way we're talking about the market and stuff i i see things a little bit differently i think we're gonna i think we're going to see an influx of inventory because i think there's gonna be a bunch of people coming out that don't want to miss this market because yep. i don't think this can go on forever um you know this is a great time for people with let's say maybe questionable location or questionable things in their house to sell their homes to get the best dollar for it right that's opinion right that's my opinion I believe we're going to get closer to what we used to call, which we haven't had for about 20 years, something they called normal, 
where we get the annual appreciation. It takes 90 to 120 days to sell a house, right? Inventory is like four to five months. I'd love to see that again, because I think that really breathes a word we haven't seen in a long time, true competition for true skills, right? And I'd love to see that a lot. I, I would love to see it too, but I'm, I'm going to give you the two factors that hold that back. I Go. sat with three or four friends in, the, in our backyard a week ago, okay? We were the least longest in our house at 19 years. So inventory is still going to be a struggle because unless you know where you're going, you're comfortable with where you are, number one capital gains taxes we need to do something and we're, we're talking about it on the lobbying and advocacy side we need to give a break to somebody that's selling their property because we need the inventory in the economy because every transaction is worth 70 to eighty thousand dollars in the economy between finance painting roofs landscaping mortgages insurance every commissions everything else at 60 to 70 thousand 70 to 80 depending on price. So we need some work on capital gains, especially for those single family investments, right? Yeah. Where people want to get rid of them, but it just doesn't benefit them too. So they keep it and just passed down in their families and it stays there forever. So if we can provide an incentive on capital gains, that's important. But the other reason is builders have not built the volume of homes since 2008 to the current time that they once did because they've been gun shot. You know, 2008 to 2012 put a lot of people out of business. Yes, it did. You remember those times. Well, uh, we were it. averaging a million and a half new homes a year back then. Right now, they're averaging between seven and 800,000 new for sale product. We're not talking about the rentals. Right. So when you right. talk about a 14 or 15 year expansion mm -hmm. or de decline, if you will, decline of 700,000 homes a year, that's 10 million less homes that have been built that could have been built around the country. We sell 6 million homes a year, roughly, as an industry. You've missed out basically a year and a half of inventory over right. that same period. And right. that gives you your resale product that you need. So as much as I hear you're bullish on more inventory, I'm still a little gun shy of those people knowing where they're going to go and the capital gains hit that they, they would take, that it's easier to stay where you are than leave. Yeah, the capital gains is, is, is the one factor that really stops a lot of people unless they plan for it and won't have it. You know, that's the only thing. That's the or other way to look at it. Or if you're like me, you bought a house in 03 and it's not worth as much as what you paid for it 18 years, 19 years later. It happens. Yeah, well, I've been on the losing end twice of uh, high market, low market. So. Yeah. But we, we didn't buy the house to make money. We bought it for a lifestyle, a community, kids to go through school, and all the factors that people, you know, individually make decisions where they want to live. Exactly, exactly. So, Charlie, we've been, we've been going for a long time. I want to thank you so much for being on today. How can people get in touch with you to ask you questions, to find out about your business, Prominent Property Sotheby's? How can people get, how can get in contact can just reach out to me, charles.oppler at gmail.com. Happy to talk to anybody about real estate or National Association. Uh, Dave, I, I don't know. I'm number 148. I've been number 115 and number 90 and 70. So I'm always looking forward to getting that hat at the end of the uh, session. So. Oh, and now you want another hat. Is that it? I only have three, I think. So. I don't know how many you got, but I don't, you know. I don't either. I've got a lot of hats over the years. So, uh, but I always enjoy spending a few minutes with you. Well, I do too, man. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to put up some, some stuff for you and I can't seem to uh, find it. But anyway, charles.oppler at gmail.com. Uh, I want Charlie, I want to thank you. Um, two questions at the end. Well, one question I have for you is how do I help you? Well, there's two questions. How do I help you with your, your job this year at the NAR, and how do I help you grow your business? Those are, that's a question I ask everybody at the end of the show. How do I help you grow your business, first of all, and then help you with the NAR? NAR is real easy for me. Just get involved on your local board level. I've told that to everybody uh, because this business is about people, and I'm sitting as the president of NAR because a guy named Bob White Jr. back in the 80s reached out and said, you're a new manager in the area. We'd love to have your company more involved. And 
35 years later, I'm, I'm the national president. Also, our PAC, make your investment. We would not have been declared an essential business during the pandemic. We wouldn't have had unemployment benefits for independent contractors without your RPAC dollars. So understand and learn about RPAC, and make, make your investment because we protect your industry. It's like trip, it's like your AAA card, right? You write the check and you hope you never need it. Well, guess what? You need it for us in real estate. And I say us because it protects your independent contractor status, which is always being challenged. Our business being essential, right? And unemployment benefits during the pandemic. As far as the business, I think just keep doing what you're doing, Dave, and, and let people know that it's not the easiest business, but it's the greatest business. And the more we educate everybody, I think we make the industry better. And and um, and that's what we try to do at our company. And I know you try to do it for the industry. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Charlie. I want to thank everybody for coming on today and watching this a little bit that they did. That would they watch it again? Next week, uh, episode 149 will be Glenn Sanford, the founder of EXP Realty. Uh, we've had some greats, and we go from one great here with Charlie Oppler to another great. Charlie, stay on. We're going to go off real quick. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching today. Uh, we'll see you next week.